Well, I don't think you can break into someone's brain and plant an, an idea. So that's fictional? Yeah. Okay. Everything's great, everything's fine. We're good in our new city, it's okay. But it's not okay. Well, you finally did it. You got me to cry. <laughs> Welcome to Cinema Therapy. I'm Jonathan Decker. I'm a licensed therapist and I love movies. I'm Alan Seawright. I'm a filmmaker and I need therapy. So, so much. But actually, today we're doing something a little bit different, Jono. What is that? Well, you're a therapist, right? Yes. Do you like to react to things? <laughs> this is like my favorite. I wake up every morning thinking, I hope I can react to something today. And my kids give me the opportunity instantly. Well, you're in for a treat, because this is going to be something you can react to, but you don't have to parent it. It's a Pixar film, Inside Out. You're going to make me cry. I'm going to make me cry, and then you're going to make fun of me. I, I will help you through your tears and then I will charge you for it. Excellent. So here we go. We're gonna, we're gonna take a look at a few scenes from Inside Out. We're gonna get his reactions and I'm going to try to also have insights. We'll see how that goes. I don't wanna get too technical, but these are called core memories. Each one came from a super important time in Riley's life. And each core memory powers a different aspect of Riley's personality. Like Hockey Island. So how true to life is this that our memories kind of form? Because th this seems, this feels accurate to life. Yeah, but it's a little simplified for the sake of the film because you're not going to have one core memory that's... That powers an entire that aspect empires, of your Yeah, yeah but you're, what you're going to have is overlapping memories forming a tapestry, right? Sure. And the overall color... So Let's say I have a tapestry of many different colors, but overall it forms red. Then it's going to look red, right? So if I have a tapestry of core memories suggesting that I have worth or that I'm beautiful or that I'm loved, there's going to be some strands in there that say that one time dad yelled at me or that one time kids picked on me. Mm -hmm. But if the overall coloring is this positive thing, that will be what that looks like. So it's a little simplified, but yeah, basically it's true. I know you're not a psychologist, this is more... I have a degree in psychology. You do have a degree in psychology, yeah. but and not a I... master's or a doctorate. Yeah, no, I have my bachelor's with psychology, my master's was family therapy. So I'm a family okay. therapist, but I, I, know, I know psychology, let's do this. And some neuroscience? There's some neuroscience I do. In I there. do know a bit of neuroscience. If I went to a neuroscience restaurant, like I'd be comfortable ordering food. Excellent. I could not ask where the bathroom was in neuroscience. Go Pixar. <laughs> oh wow. The visualizations in this movie and the animation of each of the different characters, like the animations for sadness and disgust and joy and whatever, uh -huh. the, just the way the characters move is so brilliant. Yeah. Like how they're, some of them are floppy and squishy and noodly, uh -huh. like fear. <laughs> and then anger is just this block of this rage little that, ball. that constantly stomps. Every time he takes a step, he's stomping. <laughs> yeah, that's good stuff. That's fantastic. So Riley's got a pretty good childhood. This is pretty heartwarming stuff because I see a lot of families who are, and a lot of children who've had negative experiences. They have loving parents, but the parents are inconsistent. You know, maybe the parent has a, a very strong temper problem, or there's abandonment issues where the parent loves the child but isn't there very much. And some of that is just part of growing up. Like, you, you, your parents aren't sure. always there. Yeah. But there's, you can be insecurely attached and ambivalent, insecurely attached and anxious, or you can be securely attached. And Riley, okay. her parents are there for her. They're loving, they're reinforcing, they're reassuring. And, you know, of course, this is storytelling, right? You, you set up everything's happy, and then things aren't happy, and we got to find a way back to being happy. Sure. But what we'll see in Inside Out that's really cool is we think happiness is the goal. Right. In fact, this is setting up for a classic story structure where they start happy, and then things go to heck, and, um, and then they find their way to happiness again. But the key to this movie is that happiness isn't the key. Right. And that's the most powerful thing about it, but we'll come back to that. Correct. All right, we did not die today. Don't call that an unqualified success. Well, you see there's some anger there and there's some sadness and there's a couple other things yeah, that a couple. make their way in. But like I said, she's a happy kid. She's yep. got a stable home. And right now, the film's painting this really idealistic version of childhood that it should be all love and, and safety. We love our girl. Oh, she's got great friends and we and think, you know, house. we think it should be Thanks. love and positivity. That should be childhood. Right. But this actually makes me think of Finding Nemo, the other Pixar film where he says, I promised that I wouldn't let anything happen to him, talking about his son. 
but then nothing will ever happen to you. Yeah, but then nothing will ever happen to him. That part of childhood is you have to deal with heartache and disappointment. It's a part of how we grow into adults. And if it's all happiness, there's no growth. That's the toughest thing for me as a parent is trying to, you know, let my kids experience the bad things in life in a way where they still feel loved and, and parented, but like they're also learning and growing. It's it's almost impossible to ride that line. It's yeah. really hard. Yeah, you wanna you wanna save them. Yeah. But you can't. It's just deal with it. Whoa. Try to think of something funny. Um, oh, remember the funny movie where the dog dies? Oh, yeah, that's not. Okay. What about that time <laughs> with Meg? So this is so, so, this is so Phyllis from The Office. Hi, are there any local companies that rent anti-gravity machines? What do they do exactly? They make you feel lighter. Um, anti-depressant? I could put you through to someone on that. Okay. We're starting to see here that Joy is a little obsessed with herself. Mm -hmm. You know, she's the leader of the group, and we talk about group dynamics. Joy sees herself as the ultimate goal, and everything else is subservient to her. And that's one of the themes of this film, is we think we should be happy all the time, and if we're not, then something's wrong and we got to fix it. Right. And part of what this film is about is really being at peace with our other emotions. And I see a lot of people in therapy and just in life trying to act like everything's okay and they've got it instead of just being real. And it hurts them and it hurts their relationships, this, this fakeness. Positivity is a wonderful thing as long as it's real. Right. If it's not real, then you're lying to yourself. Yeah, well, and you know, we did an episode about gaslighting recently, and this is not Mother Gothel levels of stuff, but Joy is kind of gaslighting sadness right now into telling her, you know, in a very positive and upbeat way. She means well. You're wrong and please be quiet and don't do anything. Yeah. So hard, <laughs> milk came out of her nose. Yeah, that hurt. It felt like fire. <laughs> oh, it was... Okay, okay, don't think of that. Let's try. See, and this right here is great. This is a, a common storytelling technique where at the very beginning of a film, the filmmakers will tell you, sometimes subtly, sometimes with a shot, sometimes with a glance, but a lot of times, just in dialogue, here's the end of the movie. Yeah. We're gonna get there, just wait. Yeah. And one of the things that does... And it's not telegraphing, it's planting a no, seed. No, no, it's planting a seed. And and one of the things that does, you know, that, that builds trust that like, oh, so this is going somewhere, maybe. And then at the end when it pays off, that trust is rewarded. The trust of the audience in the filmmaker yeah. is rewarded. Yeah. So. And psychologically, there is no happiness without sadness. These right. these two characters are intertwined, even though they don't really realize it yet. Joy is trying to crowd sadness out, but the fact is, if you've never felt sad, then you can't appreciate what joy is. Exactly. There's no contrast. It's just all one thing. Yeah. D a n g e r shortcut. Approve it. <laughs> Let's go around this way. Almost there. Okay. So. If you want to walk a long way. You know, I think, first of all, it's really gutsy to try and insert the concept of abstract, abstract thought. Into a kid's film? Into a, yeah, I mean, a, yeah, a kid's film. I mean, family film, but a film yeah. that kids are going to be watching and not absolutely lose them. Right. But it is, it is actually illustrative when they say this is a shortcut. Being able to form abstract thoughts, being able to grasp concepts without concrete examples to illustrate them, is a shortcut to understanding. Sure, yeah. And so when she says, let's just take this way, and it pans back and it shows they have like this huge way around. Um, you know, it, as far as children's development, when they start to be able to develop and grasp abstract concepts is a sign that they're no longer children, that they're transitioning out. Yeah. But it also, we also see Riley still a child, so going into her abstract thought, it's not really well developed and all hell's gonna break loose. It's, it doesn't go well. <laughs> I'm not missing that train. Bing Bong knows what he's doing. He's part dolphin. They're very smart. Well, He's part dolphin. They're very smart. <laughs> really is a brilliant screenplay. Oh, so good. You'll be at headquarters in no time. Oh. Hey, would you look at that? Oh, whoa. What's <laughs> happening? No, they turned it on. Ah. Never seen this before. <laughs> ah. My face! My beautiful face! Oh. What is going on? We're abstracting. There are four stages. This is the first. Not objective fragmentation. All right, do not panic. What is important is that we okay. all stay together. Oh. oh! We're in the second stage. We're deconstructing. <laughs> <laughs> so from a psychology standpoint, are these the actual 
like is abstract thought broken down into these four stages? Yeah, no, it, it absolutely is. And once again, they put this in a kid's film. And what's fun is even if kids have no idea what's going on, it's still, it's still funny. You know, yeah. even if adults have no idea what's going on, it's still funny. But uh, yeah, no, those, those are the four stages. Ah, I can't feel my legs! Ow! And I love that they reassemble themselves into just horrifying monsters. Uh -huh. Oh. It's a shut. Oh. That's stage three. It can't fit. Oh no, we're not figurative. This is the We're not gonna make it. No. Take some work to go back to reality. Go back to the normal. Absolutely. dangerous. They really should put up a sign. How long to the next train? Well, so with my kids, you know, we have them do these meditations. We've got an app on our phone that has them do meditations. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why we have them do that is because maybe they've eaten what they shouldn't or they've had too much screen time or whatever, but we need them to settle down. And in our home, like, the rule is if you have screen time, you have to do a meditation afterwards. Hmm. And part of that is that transition from, it's not abstract to literal thought, but from one reality to the other. Sure. Right? And especially if they've been watching superhero stuff, they're going to go into punching and kicking each other. Yeah. And so we actually have them do these meditations to transition out because there is a period from one to the other. Otherwise, they get stuck in between, kind of like when these characters come out and here's one reality and they're still back in the other one. I never realized that I needed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I... Uh have a real problem when I've been playing a lot of Grand Theft Auto, I will get in a car and just like, ah, oh, I hate sitting in traffic, I'm just gonna drive up on the sidewalk. I obviously never have. But, but the urge is there. The urge is there to just mow down pedestrians and drive <laughs> on the sidewalk and be Grand Theft Auto. Man. Yeah, I feel that. Yeah. This isn't another one of your shortcuts, is it? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> <laughs> this isn't really an illustration. <laughs> Through there. Oh, bing bong. <laughs> At this point in the story, is Riley asleep? Yes. What is going yeah. Okay, so let's talk about this for a second. The subconscious mind, it makes sense that this whole area would be very active right now. Mm -hmm. Because when we're asleep, when we dream, the whole purpose of that, or one of the purposes of that, is there are things that we don't want to face when we're awake. We don't right. want to think about it. So the reason we have nightmares is because we don't work through them when we're awake. And one of the ways to not get nightmares, or at least not to have consistent nightmares, is to bring the subconscious into the conscious hmm. and to actually face head on what you think you're afraid of. And sometimes you may know what's there, sometimes not. That's why it's called the subconscious. That's where a skilled therapist, psychologist can help with that. But I just think it's fascinating because some dreams truly are random, but thematically and emotionally, there's something there you're not dealing with. Interesting. My wife has dreams that I'm a terrible, mean man. <laughs> Uh -huh. And she says, and she says to me, "You're not a terrible man." I'm like, "Yeah, me, dream me is like freaking awful. Like he's he's a alcoholic, womanizer, gambler, abuser, right? Mm -hmm. Like it just what she told me is, we have it good, and I'm I think on some level I'm afraid that it's too good to be true, right. and like something's gonna happen. But she doesn't want to face that in reality, so it comes out in dreams, right? And so a lot of times when we face things in reality, we don't have the nightmares anymore because they have graduated from the subconscious to the conscious. <laughs> what does he cry? Is it candy? He's crying candy. <laughs> I love that so much. Here you are. Oh, gosh. I forgot about this. I've only seen this clowns? one time. Am I afraid of clowns? No, I'm not, but um, I'm afraid of this clown. I'm afraid of the I'm afraid of scary cinematic clowns, yeah. Yeah. Did you say birthday? Oh, gosh. <laughs> and there's gonna be cake and presents and games and food. Oh, birthday! Oh, okay. Follow us! <laughs> Nothing like a good scare to wake you up, right? I love that he's not especially evil or malicious. He just acts like a clown and he that's just, scary. He just really wants to go to the birthday party and that's what's terrifying. Oh. 
Well, that's a pretty good interpretation of a nightmare interrupting a dream. You're dreaming about something, and then something else jumps in the middle of it. And like they talk about in Inception, it only seems strange once you wake up. Right. When you're dreaming, it's like, and now here's the clown. Mm -hmm. Now we got a deal. Oh. oh no. Come on, Joy, one more time. I've got a feeling about this one. Oh, this is so sad. I don't know why I put this in here. I'm just going to cry. Take her to the moon for me. Oh. Okay. Dang it. All right. So, <clears throat> a couple things. One, sadness isn't even around, but this is where joy first feels sadness. Yep. And it reminds me of something that, that sadness is the price that we pay for love. Pain is the price that we pay for love. That the only way to not feel pain is to never feel love. And that's not a life worth living. Right. Right? Mm. And so Joy, of course, loves Riley, but she's grown to care about Bing Bong. Like sure. she, she loves him. And now he sacrificed himself. And Joy, for the first time, is experiencing what the whole film is building to. You talked about planting seeds earlier, mm -hmm. which is the importance of grief or sadness, um, which is not the same thing as despair, but right. sadness in having an emotionally full life and in truly experiencing joy. There are some things we have to leave behind for us to grow. If we try and hold on to them, then we're going to stay stagnant, even if it's hard. Yeah. And uh, it shouldn't have been Bing Bong. <laughs> shouldn't have left Bing Bong. <clears throat> I'll try. Bing bong. I promise. Boy, it got real dusty in here, huh? <laughs> I totally underestimated. Now what? Oh, what is this? So one of the things that I wanted to talk about as a person who, you know, experiences depression, not like I'm not medicated for it or anything, but you know, I experience it pretty strongly sometimes. Yeah. This is what depression feels like for me. Yeah. Is just completely losing, like the, the control panel is graying out, nothing works. Yeah. Right? There's no more levers I can pull to regulate my emotions. And, you're, and they're trying. They're trying. Like, yeah. inside my head when I'm depressed, I, I know that I'm depressed and this isn't a thing that should be happening. I should be able to feel something. Yeah. You know, and a lot of times it's I'm either only feeling one thing or I'm feeling literally nothing. Yeah. And it's it's just completely wiping me out. I get a lot of people whose family members, like anyone who doesn't actually, because there's a difference between feeling depressed and being clinically depressed or sure. feeling anxious and dealing with clinical anxiety. And the biggest difference is how much it shuts down your daily life right. or impedes your daily life. And so people who mean well just saying, well, you just got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and it's a question of willpower. It's not. Yeah, like it's, it's when you when your control panel, yeah, is completely broken. You know, that's if you're pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. Using that metaphor, you ripped on your bootstraps and they came off. Yeah, there's nothing left. Absolutely, and that's what people don't mm -hmm. understand when they say you just need to try harder. Trying isn't the issue. Right. Like that's not that's not the problem. Let me do it. Get out of here. Guys, we can't make Riley feel anything. What have we done? It's a bit like the Dementors in Harry Potter, right? As the as the cold and the dark spreads everywhere, right? Yeah. The Dementors were also representative of depression. I felt like I'd never be cheerful again. That's what how J.K. Rowling wrote it. Oh. Joy, you gotta fix this. Get up there. Sadness. It's up to you. Me? Sadness. Sadness. I can't, Joy. Yes, you can. Riley needs you. What I love 
about this is they've never trusted sadness with anything before, right? And now they're giving her like the entire panel. Yeah. Because sadness has to be felt. And here, instead of joy trying to fix it or anybody else or anger or fear, sadness is what brings Riley back because she realizes I need my family because I'm hurting instead of just shut down. And enjoy coming full circle and realizing, you know, what she said at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. Don't touch them, because then they'll all. <laughs> but it's what needs to happen. All these happy memories from the past, they're now sad memories because they're gone, because that time has passed. Yep. And Riley needs to mourn that, and her family needs to mourn that. And they've been following Joy's path the whole time of being like, no. Everything's great, everything's fine. We're good in our new city, it's okay. But it's not okay. But it's okay that it's not okay. Yeah, exactly. Well, you finally did it. You got me to cry. <laughs> For me, my mom's, my mom's gone, my mom's dead. Every happy memory I have of her is colored in blue. Like every single one is sad too, but that's what makes them beautiful. And we're crying, but our crew is, is like doing the ugly cry over there. Yeah, it's real bad over yeah, there. He's <laughs> <clears throat> so what's really impactful to me about this, oh gosh, I love this, is that there is Oh crap, and now they're gonna turn yellow. Curse you, Pixar are so good. Not just yellow. Oh yeah. You remember what happens? Yeah, that's they create right. create a new memory. Bittersweet is both. There is a type of love that is only experienced through sadness. There's a type of joy that is only experienced through grief. And in a lot of ways, it's the most beautiful of all because when we give each other comfort, we show compassion, we show empathy. That's the most beautiful form of love there is. Not, hey, I like you, or I appreciate your company, or I think you're fun, or any of these affirming, feel-good things, mm -hmm. but you're suffering, and I'm not gonna leave you. Yeah. You know, you're struggling, and I'm here with you, and I love you, and you're not alone. And that is deeper and more profound and more lasting love. So I think of families and I think of friendships and I think of marriages that go the distance. They don't go the distance because things weren't hard. You know, they go the distance because things were awful. Right. <laughs> and they found each other through that. As a therapist, this is one of my favorite films because it teaches us to embrace sadness as a means of being close and developing compassion and empathy and, and how that builds relationships in a way that nothing else really can. Yeah. Well, and as a parent, this is one of my favorite films because it's such a simple visual way to explain these incredibly complex things that you studied for years in college and in your master's program and all yeah. of those things. We can watch a movie and then have a, you know, a conversation about it and like, it's okay to feel these things. Yeah. Uh, so we just experienced, as a family, we moved from Utah to Los Angeles, and then COVID-19 happened, and we moved back. Yeah. And so it was this, you know, kind of jarring move for my kids. They were pretty excited about it and the adventure and everything. They're very, you know, adventurous kids, and so yeah. they were excited to move. And we got moved, and they were just getting settled and making new friends, and then we had to pick up and move back again. And they didn't even get to come back to their friends. They got to come back to isolation. And it was very difficult for them, but watching this film really helped us as parents explain to them, and it actually helped, <clears throat> you know, my... It's <sighs> okay, man. <clears throat> Take your time. Uh, and just my sweet little four-year-old daughter, you know, telling us that a bunch of her memories of California are yellow and blue now. She gets it. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I mean, this is why you and I started this, 
films are entertainment, but they also illustrate truth. And we talk about the, the abstract thought and how they try and go into that room of abstract thought. And, and films help us take the abstract and make it concrete. Yep. And because of Inside Out, and because you were in a student of parent and your wife in a student of parent to look for an opportunity to teach, your kids can work through stuff now. And there's gonna be so much in their life where they're like, it's okay for this to be bittersweet, right? Or it's okay to feel sad. And because there's gonna be people, and I appreciate you being vulnerable today because there's a lesson here. Look at you. You are a handsome, largish man, and you are, you know, not lacking in masculinity. And what you're, what you're demonstrating is it's okay. Like, it's okay to feel things. It doesn't take away from you as a man. It doesn't take away from you as a person. You model that for your kids. You're modeling that for everybody watching right now. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, with that in mind, we hope you've enjoyed right, this presentation on Inside Out. This will be the first in a long series of us watching Pixar movies and me crying like a baby. It's not planned and it's not performance. What it is is he knows himself and this is what Pixar does. This, I, my wife makes fun of me constantly for this. <laughs> my well wife, deserved. My wife too. <laughs> Your wife makes fun of me? For no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, if someone's gonna cry in a movie, it's gonna be me. Oh yeah. Unless she's pregnant, then all bets are off. Oh, perfect. But yeah. that's not her fault. Woo! Anyways, Understood. Uh, if you'd like to purchase Inside Out or rent it to help support this program, uh, you can. there's a link in the comments for that, as well as scheduling a 15 minute consultation with me if you'd like uh, some therapeutic help or online relationship courses. Yeah. As always, please, 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 if you like this video, share it with your friends, family, enemies. We don't care who they are, just share it with somebody. Mm -hmm. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, it's at therapy underscore cinema. And please subscribe, like, hit the bell. Until next time, connect with your family, connect with your loved ones, cry your freaking eyes out, and watch, watch movies. movies.